Where and when did you first see Adolf Hitler? Well, I think it was probably about 1933 when he had just become Chancellor and I was about eight years old, yeah. Um, what, what was he like? Did he... Well, what I remember of it is that he, I was being taken for a walk with my nanny outside his house and uh, it just so happened that at that point he came out and uh, uh, there were just a few casual people around and of course they shouted Heil Hitler and he sort of slightly lifted his hat, you know, uh, like, like a sort of democratic politician might do and he looked at me and... Um, then got in the car, <laughs> it was just one car, and the car drove off. That's, that's, I think that's my first memory of him. Did you, did you see him often? After that, I saw him quite often, yes. But gradually, of course, the whole thing became quite different. You know, he, he had a whole lot of bodyguards living in a flat in the same block, lower down. Uh, black shirt bodyguards, and I think he was nearly always in uniform, and there was a sort of procedure. One one could see he was there because the cars were parked along the curb, and uh, usually I think there were three cars, the long black Mercedes cars that you see in the newsreel. I remember them mostly completely with the hoods down and it uh, wasn't always good weather but <laughs> that's what I visually remember and you could no longer just walk along the pavement in front of his house of where, his, where you went into his block. You had to stay on the opposite side of the road and obviously sometimes when I was coming back from school or whatever, I stopped and looked. <laughs> and uh, the procedure usually was that uh, suddenly the chauffeurs of the two or three cars, I think it was usually three cars by that time he travelled with, long Mercedes cars, and the chauffeurs got in and started the engines up. And, of course, as one now knows, I didn't know that at the time, the chauffeur of the front car was one of his cronies, you know, he had a whole sort of gang of rather nondescript people around him in Munich, uh, you know, who were his cronies, one could say, and the, the, the front car was probably the, the chauffeur of the front car, and <coughs> then they started the engines up, and then the black shirts would come out, you hear the sort of jackboots clattering on the pavements, and they got into the other, got into the three cars, and then uh, he would come out and just do this and get into the car, and the thing would roar off. As a person, like he often, you often see him like with like this like terrifying aura about him. Did, did you get that impression from him? Or? <laughs> well. <laughs> I didn't see him like that. I, I, even as a child, I knew what he was about. Let's put it that way, roughly. And I wasn't impressed by his aura or anything. Yeah. Well, let's put it this way: you're obviously impressed by somebody for whom you know more or less, more and more of the world revolves around this man, you know, <laughs> which it did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the middle 30s, it did. He was arguably the most important man in the world, or <laughs> in the century, of course, one could say. Well, one vaguely knew that, and it's just a bit odd when you see it at the bottom of your road. <laughs> What was it like growing up in, in Munich in the 1930s, especially um, being a Jew as well? Well, it's, the whole thing was much more confused, I think, than people often think it was, because 
one didn't, of course, know what was going to happen. That was all in the future, and uh, uh, that it would become so radical, that it would become so self-destructive, as it, of course, did. Uh, one couldn't foresee that, but one could see it was um, a very odd setup, where increasingly the sort of very orderly and pedantic way in which things were done in Germany, you know, always by the book. Um, much more the, so than in this country where people, even officials, use a bit of common sense. The German uh, bureaucracy worked absolutely according to the book. And uh, superimposed upon that was a sort of increasingly totally arbitrary rule of personal rule of Hitler, who could. Uh, make laws, who could issue commands, who could do anything he liked. When did it become clear to you and your family that um, Hitler and the Nazis had a clear plan that was obviously dangerous for Jewish people? Well, I mean, we knew it was bad for us, and of course, almost more important in my particular case, or in the particular case of my family, was the fact that my father's elder brother was Leon Feuchtwanger, who was a celebrity, one of the best-known writers of Weimar Germany, who then pulled no punches about Hitler, who had already written the book, which is still, I think, regarded as a sort of cult novel. It's the first book about the rise of the Nazis, and it was published in 1930, and it makes fun of Hitler. He's called Rupert Kutzner, a garage mechanic with the gift of the gab, you know, who uh, stirred people up in the beer cellars and who founded a political party called the Truly Germans, as it's of course put in German. So, and this, of course, infuriated Hitler and Goebbels and one could say, well, I mean, it was said amongst the Weimar artistic, intellectual intelligentsia, my uncle was public enemy number one. And we were called by the same name, and he was, in fact, my uncle. So that was a bit... Nowadays, if one was in that situation, one would take the first plane out. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, what can you tell us about your experience of Crystal Night? Well, that was really the, 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 the breaking point. I mean, uh, we uh, knew something else was going to happen, and uh, uh, the, you, you know there was this diplomat who was shot in Paris, and that, of course, was taken as the excuse to... Uh, unleash a real pogrom. I mean, the Germans always prided themselves that they were far more civilized uh, than the Russians. The Russians did pogroms, but the Germans did it much more politely, let's put it that way. <laughs> but this was a pogrom, and uh, my father was arrested. Uh, his library was taken away, he was sent to Dachau, the concentration camp, and uh, we, of course, had no idea whether we would come out alive, because obviously, again, if they discovered that he was the brother of Leon Feuchtwein, he'd be dead, no question about that. But um, the thing was sufficiently disorganized that they didn't discover. <laughs> um, what, what was your father like when he returned from Dachau? In a bad way. I mean, it, he wasn't a particularly strong man ever. He suffered a lot from stomach ulcers, which in those days one couldn't cure. And only the year before it had a serious operation that part of his stomach was taken away 
and of course the, the whole Dachau thing was the uh, prisoners were stood endlessly out in the freezing cold and if anybody collapsed they were just killed on the spot and so on so the only way one could survive was to not draw attention to oneself I mean my father knew that and he just managed to get through it but when he got out he was full of chill planes he to go to bed immediately did eventually recover but uh, it was uh, well the whole thing was at that point designed to frighten people, mostly Jews, I think, to leave Germany, you know, it was to get out, and it achieved that purpose. Um, what has what your father told you about his experiences there as well? Well, he told me more or less what I've just said, you know, that you, you were endlessly stood out in the open in the freezing cold, that um, some people collapsed or couldn't get up in the morning and they were more or less finished off on the spot. And uh, it was uh, a totally brutal and uh, nasty regime. And, of course, the, the SS was a little bit in the background. It was the long-term prisoners. You know, I mean, Dachau was the first concentration camp that was set up. Uh, it was set up by Himmler in 1933, straight away when the Nazis came to power. And Himmler at that point was the Munich police chief, and he, he set it up. And it was full of, you know, ex-social democrats, uh, communists, uh, people who'd been arrested on those sort of grounds and who were simply left uh, for years and years and uh, they did the actual dealing with the prisoners and every now and then the SS appeared but uh, you were in charge really of these long-term prisoners of course who had to administer this brutal regime. You said that you um, moved to like you left the country as well, and you went to Winchester. What was it like? You went on your own, didn't you? I, I went on my own. It was a bit like the kinder transport, of which you probably have heard, but uh, except that I didn't go with other children. I went on my own. My father actually went with me as far as the Dutch border. Then he had to go back to Munich because... It was only a couple of months later that my parents were able to emigrate. Uh, and uh, when the train reached the border, it's uh, the Dutch border, he had to get out. And remember the SS man came, coming through the train, looking at the passports and things like that. And he said to my father, why aren't you going? And he said, well, I'm going, but in preparing to go and so on. And then, of course, <clears throat> I was for a bit alone. I went from through Holland to the Hook van Holland, which was the first time I'd ever seen the sea. It was dark. I could smell it. I could see a little bit of it. I'd never seen it before because, of course, as a child, I lived in Upper Bavaria. I've hardly ever been out of it. And... Uh, then I went across to Harwich, and uh, I remember the people on the train from Harwich to London, you know, took quite a lot of interest in me. Of course, uh, the fact that these things were going on was in the news, and, and in London I was met by uh, friends of my parents who took me from Paddington to, you know, from Liverpool Street to Paddington, uh, in a taxi, I thought for a moment it was on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and uh, then I went uh, down to Truro in Cornwall because it had been arranged that I should stay with a family in St. Moore's in Cornwall. Oh, he was the local doctor. and I mean, there were by this time quite a lot of people who 
actually undertook to take children like me in, and they did. As a, as a young child, what did you make of this experience? She must have been quite terrified for your parents back in Germany as well. Well, I suppose I, I didn't really think I wouldn't see them again. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, I did see them again. But um, I thought it was all a great adventure, really. And in a way, you know, I knew just enough about what was going on and what was what Germany was like by this time that uh, I thought the minute I was out of Germany in the Holland, I did feel like having escaped from what would later be called the evil empire. Did feel that, yeah. Um. <clears throat> And have you been back to Munich since as well? Oh, yes, a lot, quite often, yes, indeed. And um, what have you made of Germany's transformation as a country as well? Well, I mean, when I first went back, I suppose that was in the 50s. I think the first time I went back was about 1957. It was before I was married. I was with my mother. And... uh, uh, well, you did still feel a bit, what were all these people doing, you know, when when these things were going on? But, of course, we met a lot of people whom we had known before and so on and so forth. And gradually, as time has gone on, of course, one has less of that feeling because one knows present generation has um, had nothing to do with it. And... Uh, they sometimes, I think, feel a bit sorry for themselves that they've got this burden of the past weighing upon them when they, after all, did nothing about it. And but when they had nothing to do with it, it happened before they were born. I think they tend sometimes to feel, why could our grandparents, it was mostly grandparents or even further back, why were they so stupid as to fall for this uh, well you've got to take account of the circumstances in which it happened uh, I think uh, well if people get frightened if uh, they become sort of against the whole system you know the political system I think it's not doing anything for them which was, of course, the case towards the end of the Weimar Republic, they turned to things which then turned out to be even nastier and bad for them. But it happens. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, ask? Uh, yes, well, when I was a child, um, I was Hitler's neighbour. <laughs> it's quite true. I... I think it started in about 1929, when I was five years old, or scarcely five years old, and that is when he moved into our immediate neighborhood. Previous to that, he had been in a much less salubrious part of Munich, a much less fashionable part, and he then was able, to, by that time, it was 1929, the party was on the up and up, had more and more money and so on and so forth, and he was able to move into that kind of uh, place. And I mean, the first thing I remember hearing about it was that my mother said, uh, we haven't got much milk today because the milkman said he had to leave more bottles at Hitler's flat and things like that, you know. <laughs> Thank you. When um, when you were at school, yeah, um, how much were you affected by the by the sort of Nazi regime um, growing up in school? Uh, oh, quite a lot. I mean, not obviously only from nineteen thirty three onwards. But this is something I you I can show you, and you can take photos of it. My teacher, when I was I was in primary school, and in those days. You changed from one class to another in April, not in September. So in April 1933, I'd been 
in school for two years. It was, I was entering my third year, and I I was with a, a our teacher was a woman, perhaps some you know the mid late thirties. I couldn't say, and she was obviously a convinced probably a convinced Nazi, or she certainly was uh, the type of German who thought that Nazi coming to power was a very good thing. It was a, a kind of um, euphoria-inducing thing. And he, she pushed all those things out onto us kids straight away. Obviously, in 1933, the regime wasn't sufficiently firmly established or sufficiently pervasive to have made all teachers do it. By the following year, any teacher would have had to do it. But this lady did it straight away. I mean, within weeks of the Nazis coming to power. And, well, I can show you the exercise book that I've still got of that period.